We're very privileged to have uh, Professor Brian Collins from University College London with us this evening. Brian um, is a former Chief Scientific Advisor to two UK government departments, the Department for Transport and the Department for Business. He's currently Professor of Engineering Policy at uh, UCL and he leads uh, work in the areas of city livability uh, and the future of cities. Uh, and just more recently, he's pulled together a team of 14 of the top universities in the UK uh, with a, a massive research program in uh, looking at uh, infrastructure and cities in the future. Brian is one of the leading thinkers in a, an international collaboration of universities in uh, the future of infrastructure, next generation infrastructure. And uh, I'm, I'm sure he'll be very open to taking any questions you have. Please join me in welcoming Brian Collins. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Jim. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one, one of the things I've noticed is this lectern slopes in such a way that were I to ask for a glass of water, it wouldn't stand up. Um, <laughs> Major design flaw. Um, I hope you all had a good journey here. Uh, when I talk about travel, usually someone says, well, it could have been better. Um, and that, of course, is, is part of the objective of, of this evening, is to talk about, well, what, in what way could the travel experience, the journey experience that all of you have had to be here tonight could have been better? And, and of course, you've been asked questions about that. Um, I want to talk about the future of travel, but it's quite interesting, at least to me, and I hope it might be to you, to talk about the history of travel. In, certainly in, in Western Europe, where I live, now I'm going to do that, I think, Jim, um, and uh, 150 years ago, most people uh, didn't, uh, also, thank you, but yeah. Um, <laughs> One way or another, I'm going to bend down and look thoroughly incapacitated while I pick up my glass of water. Um, most people didn't travel more than about 20 kilometers from where they were born through most of their lives. Uh, and it's only in the last 150 years or so that unless you were a soldier or you went to sea, that you actually traveled a significant distance from where you were born during a lot of your life. So in periods before that, um, actually, it wasn't seen as something you had any expectation of being able to achieve, travel. It's a relatively recent phenomena in generational terms. Um, now, we tend to regard the opportunity to travel as a human right. If you've got the money, you can travel anywhere on the planet. And I, of course, have just done that in the sense of going halfway around the planet to be here. Um, and it's purely a matter of e economics and finance as to whether or not you can do it, plus or minus those countries that limit the uh, ability of their citizens to travel. Um, and sadly, that's just a piece of paper or not having a piece of paper, which is um, a, a sad um, situation with regard to the human race. Um, so the infrastructure that supports travel is also, therefore, a relatively new phenomena, whether it's roads or canals or railway systems or aviation systems. And if you look again at the history, particularly in, in uh, obviously I know more about Western Europe, is the roads that we've inherited in England were largely roads that were built by the military in Roman times. Um, and they're dead straight lines that go between where they had big encampments. And so a lot of our main roads in London, uh, sorry, in Britain, are still built on the back of those Roman roads. And if you put one on top of the other, you find we actually haven't moved those roads very much. That is an example of the legacy of the infrastructure to support transport and travel, which we've inherited, and indeed every city now is inherited, in the sense that the first generation of infrastructure that supports travel that is put in by the first generation that live in a city make it quite difficult for any subsequent generation to change what it was was put in the first time. In London, we're investing a huge amount of money at the moment transforming some of that um, because London, as the megacity of Europe, has realized that unless it does that, it's not going to sustain itself for the next 20 or 30 years. So we're spending tens of billions of pounds in London transforming the way in which our travel infrastructure and transport infrastructure is constructed. And it's different from what we have had that was built in Victorian times. 
So I, I wanted to just touch on that because travel is to some extent limited by the physical infrastructure that we have put in over, over periods of decades or centuries. And uh, that limitation is something one has to take account of. And it's clearly something that in this country you also have to take account of, even though you're a much younger country than we are. So what I first of all want to just make sure we understand is the modes of travel that we think we're going to be able to use. And this is just a cartoon of all the things that are, are relevant to your ability to think about traveling. Um, and you'll recognize most of those that um, you either use or have, had you, have, have used, either for business purposes or for leisure purposes, both within New Zealand and outside New Zealand. And that, of course, applies everywhere. Um, one of the things that most of you will also realize is that with one or two exceptions, they all need energy. So you can't actually say very much about traveling unless you've got energy sources. Um, and some of them, of course, like a balloon, the energy source is a somewhat random one. It's the wind, and you, it goes where the wind takes you. And that actually is more of an exploration than a journey, because you actually don't know where you're going to end up. Um, and journey where you know where you want to end up, a balloon is not a particularly helpful device to use. So all the others need energy in order to direct you to where you want to be. So one of the things we've discovered, which may sound a bit, bit philosophical, is that you can't talk about travel without talking about energy. And if you don't have sustainable, reliable, resilient energy sources of the right type, then your travel options are somewhat limited. And as we enter into an era of trying to reduce the amount of, of fuel we burn in, from hydrocarbon sources to enable tr travel systems to work, that becomes a problem. In our country, half the energy that we use is in the form of fuel in transport. Half. So people talk about reduction in um, energy consumption as if reducing electricity consumption is going to be, or, or changing the way in which we source electricity, is going to be the right way of dealing with the carbon emissions problem. It will only reduce it if you do something to transport as well. And that's a really important factor. Um, and I'll say something about electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles later. So the other aspect of travel is you need infrastructure on which to run your transport systems. And some of them are sort of interlinked. Um, you may be able to recognize this is a set of roads adjacent to an airport. So we're using roads and aviation as a coupled set of systems. Um, and we also forget on occasions that most of us who import and export goods rely heavily on the ability for ports to operate effectively and efficiently. And in our country, we've got about three weeks of food in the UK. Um, we import a lot. You import quite a lot of manufactured goods in this country. So th the efficiency of ports operating is really very important. And I'll come back to one of the factors that makes ports work very efficiently in a moment, because you might not know that it's a factor. Um, we, like you, have a certain amount of railway systems. We have a lot of railway systems. Actually, most of our railway systems were built in the 19th century. We decommissioned about a third of it in the 1960s. Um, and now we're trying to put some of it back because the arguments on which we decommissioned it were fallacious um, and uh, driven by pure economics, uh, if that's a, not a misrepresentation of economics. Um, and lastly, of course, we have to see that all of these modes of transport are interlinked with each other. So they share this space. It's quite important to realize that certain modes of transport share infrastructure space and some don't. And it's roads that are the major problem in the sense that roads are the infrastructure space that are shared, is shared by a number of different modes of transport. Aviation is sort of only aircraft, and ships are the only form that are on, on the sea. But roads, and railway, sorry, railways tend to be railways, right? So roads are an interesting phenomenon in terms of the infrastructure in that it is shared between bicycles and motorbikes and cars and lorries and trucks and buses. All the others are, tend to be mono uh, vehicle. Um, the other aspect I want to talk about is our appetite for risk before I start talking a bit more about where travel is going and a little bit about a history, that when we built a lot of our infrastructure in Victorian times in the, in the 19th century, the appetite for risk-taking in the building of that, those systems was huge. 
partly because the way in which we went about doing it was owned by very few, very rich people, like a few thousand people. They owned all the land, all the money, they weren't taxed, they bribed their way into Parliament, so they owned all the executive decisions, and without making any ethical statement, Labour was free and disposable. It either came from Ireland or it came from some other part of the Commonwealth, what we would now call the Commonwealth was called the Empire at the time. So between about 1840 and 1880, we did some fantastic um, uh, civil engineering constructions which built our railway system, some of our, our turnpikes which then turned into our main roads. And as a result, we now 150 years on have inherited a hugely capable but now aging and decaying railway infrastructure, uh, the health of which we know very little about because it wasn't very little design uh, was put on the ground, they just built it. Uh, we don't know what's underneath the foundations of a lot of it. We have 40,000 bridges in the railway system and a lot of them are more than 100 years old and we're now running more trains, heavier trains, faster trains and it's slightly worrying that that is the case. So the atti attitude to risk taking was huge and now we're in a position where not only are we en as engineers and scientists and builders and architects more risk averse, what is also true is our politicians, sorry for politicians in the room, are also very risk averse, partly because the media won't let them take risks. So there's a media political capital intersection around not only transport but, and, and, and journeys, but also around infrastructure in general. And one of our anxieties is if we don't manage to start managing taking big, bigger risks, not taking bigger risks without managing them, we won't be able to modernise our infrastructure into the place which makes it fit for the next century. So we have to find a way of taking more risk, but in a controlled and managed way than we've been doing for the last 40 or 50 years. And that's why I just wanted to say something about risk taking as well as risk managing. Um, because when you are in a situation where your first or second generation of transport infrastructure is limiting your ability to travel, then in order to get out of that lock-in situation, you've got to take some risks. And that means managing them in order that you don't per produce perverse outcomes. And it's not just technical risk, it's political risk and financial risk. Emphasise managing them, not just taking them. So, what we are now dealing with is increasingly complex systems in which we're attempting to travel. Transport, as I indicated, is not isolated from a lot of other areas. And there's two in this diagram which I wanted to touch on as all those things came up, and I hope you recognise most of them as they built, is firstly on the bottom right-hand corner, the cloud. The IT people in the world will say, no, it's a data centre. Well, it is, but it's what now most people call the cloud. And if you think you're going to build a smart infrastructure in order to provide smart journeys, the data and the information gets held and processed somewhere. And the cloud is where it happens. But you may not know where the data center is that makes up the cloud. And that matters if it's personal information, which increasingly you want because you want personalized journey optimization. It matters where it's held, because if your personal information is held in a country other than the one in which you have the jurisdiction, you won't be able to control the exploitation of your personal data. And that, for some countries, is a really big issue. It's a big issue in our country at the moment, and people are really worried about identity management, identity fraud, and personal information being exploited for the wrong purposes as they see it. The second area which is important is in the top right-hand corner. You may think, what have satellites got to do with my journey? Well, first of all, the clock of the world is on the GPS network of satellites. Everything in this room would stop instantly if the GPS satellites went down. All your mobile phones would stop working, the lights would go out, this microphone would stop working. The clocks that drive everything are driven by GPS. There's almost no redundancy now being put into new systems because it's too expensive to do that, because GPS is for free. It's in your mobile phones, and you don't even know most of the time that that's what's keeping everything running in your phone and all the backbone of your phones. But it also satellites, not just GPS, that provides meteorological information, provides Earth resource information, communication satellites. And a lot of what we now operate with is actually dependent upon space systems working properly all the time, 24 by 7. And that dependency really does impact transport. Almost all transport would stop. And I did mention just now the issue of ports. Big tankers and big freighters are docked using GPS with millimetric accuracy. 
And about four weeks ago, the US government decommissioned one of the satellites in GP, of the GPS satellites in order to upload some new software to it. But they forgot to put in the corrections to all the other satellites that needed to be put in because one was taken out. And that meant the locational accuracy in certain parts of the world was 400 meters out. If you're docking a 200,000 ton tanker by GPS without knowing exactly where it is, if no one looked out the window at the opposite point, you do billions of dollars worth of damage to your port and your tanker as it ran into the ground at whatever speed it was going. So I just wanted to make sure we understood that when we talk about travel, we're talking about it in, a co in the context of a whole set of complex engineered systems and in some socio-technical systems as well, one of which is illustrated by um, the, the tower in which the clock Big Ben sits, because that's the complexity of, of a democratic government. And that in itself is a complex social system, political system, and you have a version of it here as well. It's different from ours, and every, every developed democratic country is different. In fact, every country is different. So we depend upon the complex social system of governance as well as the engineered systems. And that affects how we think about travel as well. So these are the sorts of things that make up this complex system. First of all, that things are rapidly changing and uncertain. So we have to make decisions, as has as been illustrated in, in the briefing about the um, uh, engagement for, for this project just now in a rapidly changing world. There is uncertainty. So we need to find mechanisms by which we handle that uncertainty. Um, in certain areas, it's global, of course, if you're talking aviation or, 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 or logistics for long haul freight. A lot of our transport and, and journey enabling systems are privatized. We have found it to be more economically efficient, financially efficient, but is it more effective? Well, we're still experimenting with the balance between private ownership and non-private ownership in transport systems. Uh, in our country, we've gone really overboard to privatize. Um, personal opinion, I'm not sure we've got that exactly in the right place, because financial and economic efficiency may not deliver social effectiveness. We need to achieve sustainability. I was talking to colleagues about sustainability earlier. What do we really mean by sustainability? Over what period? Because sustainability can lock you in, but it can also give you adaptability. And of course, we're trying to achieve a much lower, if not zero, carbon emission from transport systems. We want more engagement, as is absolutely true this evening, in democratization of, of engagement of processes in, in, in journey planning so that our journeys and hence our travel experiences is better democratized. And how we create value in our society as a result of the journeys rather than lack of value because we get fed up, fed up with congestion or overcrowding or de delay or, or accidents. The Internet of Things may be a way in which we enable, enable transport and journeys to be um, better but it may also be a vulnerability because it may also become a, a dependency we don't know how to handle. Um, we are dependent upon global supply. We are dependent upon innovation, but it may be constrained by safety. And as I've already indicated, I hope that infrastructure in support of travel um, is one which, where the interdependency with all the other infrastructure components is getting deeper and richer and is yet relatively ungoverned because it tends to be an operational issue that is fixed at the time of building things rather than designed at the, at the point of, uh, of, 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 of early stages of program um, conceptualization. So the nature of travel, first of all, is what's the purpose? Why are we traveling? And if you can't answer that question in terms of investment, then don't do it. Um, so one of the issues that I think we're facing across the world is, is are there alternatives to travel where the cost of putting in the means by which we would otherwise do it become prohibitive. And I say cost in the broadest sense of the word cost. Because if we don't understand the purpose, is it to get people to work? Is it to get people to school? Is it to get people to see their family? Is it to go for leisure activities? The answer could be all of those and a mixture of them. Um, but if you can't articulate it, then why would you do it? And what is the value to I, m myself as an individual and to the community which is affected by my traveling purpose? Um, is also something that needs to be articulated. It's not just about me, it is about the use of the shared infrastructure uh, and the shared platforms on which we travel. Now actually, the private car, of course, is the epitome of my castle on wheels that I travel around in a shared space. It's the nearest thing I can do to not share 
um, in, in, in a travel experience, because all public forms of transport are like that. Of course, your bicycle is also a public, uh, sorry, a private space, but it's a bit more exposed than your car. But nevertheless, the value to me is that. Now, to whom does the value accrue when you compare it with, sorry, the cost is, that I'm going to incur? And quite often, the cost is, is placed in one place, and the value accrues somewhere else. And our accounting systems do not take very good account of that. We have, do the cost accounting around where the implementation costs are, and hence the value, and yet the value accrues somewhere else. Um, I, in my time at the DFT, I saw massive numbers of examples where the, the accounting principles were really getting in the way of doing the right thing. Everyone knew that, what the right thing was, but the, the accounting processes and the contracting processes limited our availability, sorry, our ability to, to deliver on that. And so going further and saying, so if I did all of that, you still have to worry about how acceptable the solutions that you might come up with with regard to my or my community's desires to achieve a travel purpose might be. Um, and it's ironic, is it not, that we all like to come and work in a, in a city which is relatively dense because we get paid a lot. We have a nice quality of life with lots of people around us. And as soon as we walk out of there with strangers on a bus, it becomes overcrowding or congestion because there's other people on the road that want to get out or don't get out of our way because we want to get home quickly. Um, so we like the uh, agglomeration effects of economic value in, our, in the way in which we deliver high wage earning capacity and, and good mental stimulation in working closely with lots of people. But as soon as we're away from it, we hate it. And there's certain irony in that, so I'll come back to that in a moment, because that is one of the value propositions we have to get a better understanding of, is, is, is what, what's the balance? What is the trade-off between high wage capability and economic activity in a dense urban environment where you have to pay a price in terms of having some congestion and the way you couch that question is exactly that so what's the acceptability but there's also what's the consequence of doing that and it may be my emissions from my engine on my car um, it may be the noise that I create, it may be the noise I create by getting in an aircraft, as Jim and I will do later, um, which frighteningly always does noise abatement as it goes over a built-up air and you think engines just keep running, keep running, because at that point you're a bit worried it might not. And let alone, of course, the carbon emissions. One of the things I learnt, by the way, as an example of, of the interrelationship between all these things, is in London we have quite a difficult problem because it's a, it's a mega city, it's eight and a half million people. We have, still have quite a lot of diesel traffic and we have particulate pollution in London, which is now above the levels which are regarded as acceptable. But I was talking to the deputy mayor of London uh, about three weeks ago and she said what a lot of people don't realise is only half the particulate pollution comes from the emissions from the engine. Half of it comes from brakes and from tyres. Because if you think, well, tyres wear, don't they? Where's the bit that's worn off? It doesn't just stay on the road. It, some of it gets scrubbed off and put in the air. You'll all appreciate that if you've got badly maintained roads, you scrub your tyres more quickly. So there's a connection between pulmonary health and road maintenance. Now think about how you would account for that in any public sector accounting process where local road maintenance is down here and public health um, pulmonary um, lung treatment is over there. Really difficult to get your heads around that, um, but it would be quite possible to see that actually the cost of dealing with, with lung disease, um, if that went down, could easily be transferred to repairing roads. So this nature of, of travel um, coupling between all these, the purpose and all, the, all these other factors is, is what I wanted to try and get across uh, with that slide. It therefore takes on the issue of how do you uh, not only assess all the problems and our needs, but you have to do it, as I've suggested, in a legacy infrastructure environment. And what we are doing is failing to be able to do that. And as Jim indicated, one of the things I've spent the last two or three years doing is, is creating the business case and the science case for a very large uh, research program. Um, could be pushing four to five hundred million pounds over the next five years, not just in transport, but in understanding how to do all these things at scale in a much better way. Um, and so we have to do all that. 
we have to understand how to build a de and maintain a developed society, get more value out of it for less money. Um, because it's been too easy to do it the easy and quick way right now. The second or third or fourth generation implementations of these things have got to be done better. And what we're understanding how to do that is that we need to learn how to do it better and we need to do it together. So one of our missions that Jim and I talk about over a bottle of Pinot sometimes is how do we do collaboration better, both nationally and internationally, when most of the metrics for success are, are metrics for competition, not metrics for collaboration. So profitability isn't a good metric for good collaboration, and yet it's what most companies are measured by. Um, and if you don't understand how to learn how to do things, you keep making the mistakes of history. And that is all too often the case. So understanding in a pedagogical sense, as well as an organizational learning sense, how to learn from what you have done by trying to do things is a really good idea. And if we don't do that, we're going to go into decline. And that decline will be economic, social, and environmental all together. And it, you can witness that in some parts of the world already, where those factors which, for whatever reason, the governance was completely broken, have now got into a situation where, where things are not very, very happy at all. So the issues of, and this is a sort of reprise, really, of some of these arguments that I've tried to put together here. Why do we want to travel? What are our purposes? What shared infrastructure and vehicles are available to us to do that? Because it won't just be one mode. And, and indeed, the arguments, I think, around the program that you're, we were talking about earlier is there are lots of modes available to you to think about how you manage the issues in, in Wellington. Um, and you've got a certain amount of infrastructure flexibility. But how you join them all up together in a sensible way is, is a, obviously one of the questions that needs to get, be answered. I've indicated that you need to understand, or we need to understand, how the value and the cost are coupled together in a much more holistic way than we currently think about doing that, doing it. And how does that vary with density and capacity? And then, of course, there's a temporal aspect to that within a day or within a month or within a year uh, because of the, the phenomena of everyone wanting to get to work at the same time or taking their kids to school at the same time. So one of the things we're doing is developing really sophisticated models of how all this works, not just technical models, but socio-economic political models, putting the political decision-making into the modeling. Um, in much the same way that people are now doing that for international negotiations on trade deals. They're using game theory to understand how to do that. So we can do that in exactly the same way in, in, in this context. Because we have the, the knowledge and we're beginning to get the data out of cities and out of infrastructure on what is actually happening. And then we can play tunes with, we can put, do experiments with how we could do it differently. And it's much cheaper to do it in a computer model than it is to do it and build it and get it wrong and then say, oh, well, we've just got to take out a few kilotons of concrete that we put in the wrong place. The new kid on the block in all of this is how does digital change things? And I use the word digital to sort of cover anything to do with ICT. The jury's out on to what extent it changes things. Does it allow people to work remotely some of the time in different time zones? It certainly allows me and Jim to work together in different time zones. How does it do that? Is it a sustainable model? Or actually, do we need the sort of interaction we're getting here and now, and me attempting to read your body language as I'm talking to you, and you're reading my body language, and maybe that's a reaction? And if I was on the end of a video stream in London, we wouldn't get that sort of richness, I hope. Um, so what would it take to actually do that? However, digital is going to change things with regard to the provision of high quantity, high quality, timely data about what is going on in my travel experience, our travel experience, in a way where balancing the need and the purpose against the provision of service may be much more dynamically assembled. So we were t I was talking to a colleague the other day about the concept of having things at airports called terminal buildings. Think about the word terminal. What is it terminal for? Well, it's not terminal for me, it's terminal for the aircraft. So if the whole of the design of the airport is to make sure that it works effectively for the terminating of the aircraft in its journey, it may not be optimum for me at all. And you'd be surprised to know that Terminal 5, when it was designed, they knew that, and they've actually designed it to be optimum for the passenger and not optimum for the aircraft. Well, which is interesting. Think of a railway terminus, a bus terminus, a bus stop. It's all about the vehicle. It's not about me. And yet, why it's there is all about me, because I provide the money that makes it viable. So there's a lot of thought going in now as to why are bus stops where they are? Why aren't the buses stopping where I am? 
That would be more useful, wouldn't it? Uh, and with digital, we can start doing that. We can start having 16 people at the side of the road saying, we want a bus. Uber does that, right? Yeah. Uber delivers you a taxi where you want it. We experience one in, what, about a minute and a half today. Now, you may not like the business model, but from a passenger point of view, it's fantastic. Um, and of course, it may not be just taxis. It may be other forms of autonomous vehicles that may turn up that you get in and you drive. And if it was electric, it would be zero carbon emissions. So there's an interesting metaphor if, you, if your energy supply is zero carbon, caveat. So digital could change quite a lot of things. But you really need to think about radical ways of behaving differently and owning things differently and conceiving of your travel to be different from how we are at the moment. But that may be the, 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 the way out of some of the log jams, not necessarily all, that we want to get out of. And some of the externalities that are changing acceptable solutions are things like changing demographics, uh, changing frequency of extreme events, uh, by which I mean uh, weather events. Um, and those are certainly changing the way in which we're thinking about some of our infrastructure for the future. So there's a whole raft of things that we need to take into, a, into account simultaneously. And the other aspect of this is we can't de deal with any of those in isolation from all the others, hence the complexity argument. So one of the things we're doing is how to organize ourselves in order to manage this ubiquity of change, because everything is changing. And we've got an idea around doing that, which is, this is a bit to do with how you do it. Um, and first of all, obviously understanding where we are now, and that's part of what, what we're now uh, doing, is learning from the experience we've got, the statistics, in other words, the trends of what things are changing in what, what way. What are the patterns of concern, which I think is, is what you just described you're about to do in the program here, and then understanding what the risks are. But at the same time, looking at what are the purposes on which we're attempting to achieve improved travel, what are our strategic options, um, where does the value accrue and what is that potential added value? It may not be in the travel domain itself, it may be in retail, it may be in, in leisure facilities, it may be in the gym, because that makes people easier to get to those places where they can stay fitter, which has an impact on hospitals and healthcare bills or insurance. So that balance risk and opportunity, and hence the decisions that get taken, are taken on a much more holistic basis. Now, have we got a governance structure that allows us to get anywhere near that? Almost everywhere I go, the answer is no. Uh, it can be <laughs> hell no, or it can be no, but we're moving in that direction. And what I was talking to the mayor earlier, I, I think the mayor has left, um, was, well, actually, the city mayors around the world are actually now talking about cities getting their act together to tell nation states how this stuff ought to work. That's a conversation that's interesting. That wouldn't have happened 10, 15 years ago. Part of it, of course, is enabled by digital because they're sharing stuff much more quickly than they ever could before. So to provoke a bit of questions, hopefully not too difficult questions, how much congestion is acceptable? As I said earlier, you all like the idea of being in a city because of the buzz of the city, but you hate the fact that it has a certain amount of congestion. So how much do I have to reduce it by to make it acceptable uh, in order for it to be the, the livable place you want it to be? How much choice between modes of travel do you want to have? If you're going to share the road, how, do you want to share the road space exactly that I can drive my car, my bike, my motorbike, and my bus on the same bit of road? Or I'm going to segregate them laterally or temporarily, which of course you can do. Um, so we have a campaign not to have heavy delivery lorries in London other than during the night. So the London doesn't get big lorries during the day. Um, you have to pay and get big exceptions to break that. How do we value, a set value in domains other than transport, which I've touched on at length? Digital, as I've indicated, could change things quite a lot, but can it change it enough? And that comes back to answering some of the other questions. So again, a bit of modeling and analysis to answer that question. Actually, are there good reasons for traveling other than the ones which I historically said, you know, marching to the nearest place or going to the port uh, or taking your food to market? Historically, the sorts of reasons why people traveled and otherwise they probably didn't. Now we have lots of nefarious reasons why people travel. Our roads are probably busier on Saturdays now when there are premiership football games on because there are hundreds of thousands of supporters traveling to where the away games are. 
And actually, motorways, and because they only do it at weekends, and quite often, I'm afraid, they're not as sober as they ought to be, our motorways are damn dangerous at certain times on Saturday afternoons, usually after the games, especially if they've lost. So you really do have to worry about travelling on our roads on Saturday afternoons in the winter, when, of course, the roads and the weather can be, can be a little bit inhospitable. So that purpose of travel and the freedom to be able to do it is a relatively recent phenomena. Um, and now a lot of people aren't doing that, they're getting on the trains. That's worse, because the trains are overcrowded. It's not dangerous, but actually a rowdy cr football crowd on a train coming back from a away match which they've lost is equally bad as being on the road in some ways. So there's lots of purposes for travel, let alone leisure, which you know, you know here, because if you need to go on vacation other than in New Zealand, you've got to travel quite a long way to, to do it. And without aviation, you wouldn't be able to do it. So aviation is absolutely critical. Um, to, to here in New Zealand. Do autonomous make, vehicles make a difference? Yes, they can do, because you can pack a lot more vehicles into certain circumstances onto, onto the shared transport infrastructure uh, for certain types of trip journey and certain types of circumstance. Um, but planning for their use in those ways um, is an important part of the design philosophy. Um, <clears throat> We're doing that in Milton Keynes, a suburb t town of London. Uh, we've got 300 autonomous vehicles flying around in the mixture of everything else. Um, and it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a, one of our new towns, so it's a grid, right angle intersections, very well laid out. The mapping is incredibly accurate. So it's really quite a good way, good place to start testing, to see whether if it'll work there, then at least we can, if it doesn't work there, then it's gonna be much more difficult to do it in, in, in a city like London. And if you want to change all these things at scale, then the governance model between the city, the communities, the national state, and, and in some cases international standards has to be looked at. So we've got a whole raft of different things we've got to try and get right simultaneously for a lot of these things to happen. Uh, I want to finish just by showing you a picture, a set of pictures. First of all, uh, this is an example of uh, London Bridge at Russia. And it shows the example of where the pedestrians are segregated from the roads, but the cyclists and the cars and the buses are not segregated from each other. And that's an example of why I was saying about not segregating the use of the shared road space. The irony, of course, is underneath the road, what a lot of people forget about are electricity cables, sewers, water pipes, telecommunications cables. So if any of those fail and the road has to be dug up, why do we keep burying things under roads which are nothing to do with transport? Anyway, um, an aside. This is Amsterdam where they clearly separated bicycles from trams, no cars, because the public transport system is rich and deep enough to make cars a non-starter. And of course, a lot of people cycle in Amsterdam. We were just talking earlier about how is, when, when and how did that happen? And I actually don't know. There may be people in the audience who do know. Is it a cultural thing? Is it just because it's flat? Uh, and so on, you know, lots of reasons. Um, and this place you'll recognize. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> which, actually, I could have chosen a photograph from almost any major city at Russia and shown you the inbound traffic jams and the other lanes largely empty. And when I, not long ago, was up on the, one of our tall towers in London looking down at the roads at Russia, most of the roads were empty. And almost all the, uh, you know, most of them were empty and the few that weren't had gridlocked um, traffic on it that wasn't moving. Well, that's not intelligent transport. That's not an intelligent journey management system. So some way we need to use our road space much more intelligently than we currently are. Um, but in all of these pictures, there is actually indications of heritage. And one of the other factors, the legacy we need to worry about is our heritage. That is a painting of Westminster Abbey that Canaletto painted in 1749. I had the privilege when I was the chief scientific advisor in the Department for Business that that was the view I had out the window. It hasn't changed. And that's a good thing for me. Um, you may have also noticed uh, on the opening slide, I have the great honor and privilege of being awarded a companion of the bath and honor by the queen. And there's an order of the bath, which is the third oldest, third oldest order the procession in front of Westminster Abbey is actually the procession of the Knights of the Order of the Bath that were there when Canaletto, Canaletto painted it, because the order was founded in the early 18th century in 1708. 
And I therefore have a privilege of being part, not only of seeing Westminster Abbey when I go to London, but also being part of, a, of an order of, of um, chivalry, which uh, is, is part of our heritage. So there's a social heritage that I'm part of personally, which is enacted in this picture. So it's, for us, I think it's also very important to understand that although we may want to modernize and, and improve our current experience, it is in a historical and a cultural context. And I only use our cultural context because I recognize cultural context here is, is a deeper and richer and different issue, but it's true in every country. So understanding the impact of cultural heritage on what you can and cannot do is as important of what, as what your individual and collective demands for travel might be. And that's another constraint, it's another factor that has to be taken into account, which I think is, is pretty important. So I want to end there. Thank you very much.